Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Becky Robinson. I'm so thrilled to be here today with Susan Fowler and Gary Ridge for what is sure to be the best hour of learning all month. <laughs> Thank you. We we are so excited for the launch today of Susan's brand new book, the second edition of Why Motivating People Doesn't Work and What Does. And as you're joining us in the Zoom room, we would love to invite you to tell us in the chat where you are calling in from today. And if you happen to be participating in this webinar as part of your professional development, we would also love to know what organization you represent. So I'm gonna take a look as these are coming in. I can see we already have an international audience and people from nearly every single state in the United States. So I'm gonna call out the internationals just quickly. We have South Africa, we have Stockholm, Sweden, we have India, we have the UK. Um, we want these events to be inclusive and a place where people find community. So I do want to let you know that we have closed captioning available for you. It's in the bottom of your Zoom panel. So in the event that your learning would be enhanced by using those captions, we invite you to turn those on or uh, look for the other language options that may be available for you there. Some more uh, countries to call out. I see Denmark, I see Germany, I see London, UK, again, uh, Belgium, again, it, that's the first time for Belgium. Uh, this is amazing to see. It's also amazing to see a number of various organizations represented. I saw FedEx, I see Red Deer. Um, I see Virginia Tech. So thank you to all of you who are choosing to invest an hour of learning with us. And Susan, I think it's only fitting that we have people here from multiple countries because this book in its first edition was translated into 14 languages. So chances are, depending on where you are, you may be able to get this book um, in the first edition in your own language. I see so many, so many people who are uh, talking to me in the chat and I, I can't possibly uh, note them all, but I want you to know that we are so grateful for your participation. And throughout today's event, there will be opportunities for you to post your questions later on. Susan and Gary will be sharing them. So before we dive into today's content, I do want to let you know a few other technical considerations. One is that we are also streaming live on Facebook. If you would want to go there and share this with your friends, we are recording today's event. We will make the recording available to you later as well. So before we uh, turn things over to Susan and Gary for this conversation, I want to take a moment to introduce my friend and client, Susan Fowler. I've been privileged over the years to watch Susan grow in her journey as an author, a researcher, a speaker, a developer of content with the Ken Blanchard's Blanchard Company. She was the lead developer on the self-leadership content. And now Susan has this exciting new venture called Mojo Moments, which is a company dedicated to building psychological capacity in leaders at all levels. And it's been amazing, Susan, to see you step into this amazing and powerful new role as CEO of your own training organization. That The Mojo Moments Channel Partner Network spans the globe and they do that in order to deliver empirically sound and innovative learning experience. Susan, I could not be happier for you and the success and the impact that you're having with your content. So I'm thrilled to turn things over to you now so that you can introduce Gary and so that we can dive into today's learning. Gary who? <laughs> so hello, thanks Becky, that was really sweet. And uh, Gary Ridge um, is gonna explain to you how um, I know him, but I want to tell you why I wanted to choose Gary for this auspicious day. Uh, this is the release of the book. It's a big day. Um, whenever you have a new book released, it's like not quite like having a baby, but close. <laughs> and so I wanted to share it with Gary. And I want to just read uh, just a couple of things that when Gary was president, or excuse me, CEO of WD40 company for 25 years, the company's market cap, and if you don't know what that means, doesn't matter. Just listen to these numbers grew from 300 million to 2.5 billion under Gary's leadership. And he delivered, or they delivered, a shareholder return of 1,369%. I didn't even know you could go over 100%, but yeah. I, guess, I guess you can. I guess you can. Yeah. Warren Buffett called the company, he thought it was the most competitive moat on the planet. And I had, if, if, if you're like me, I had to look up moat. And what that means is that he... Warren Buffett feels that WD-40 company has the ability to fend off competition and maintain profitability 
into the future. So they're kind of all like on this island that it's gonna be really hard for outside forces to bring them down. And so the reason I share this with you is to make a point that oftentimes we think when we're talking about motivation that that's a fluffy topic or when we're talking about psychological sense that that is a nice to have, not a have to have. But what Gary Ridge has proven is that it makes good business sense to pay attention to people's psychological well-being and how they feel and how they are engaged at work. And so I thought he was a perfect example for what we're trying to get out into the world. So Gary, thank you so much for, for coming seven minutes, the long drive over here to, to join me. So um, why don't you share with people how we met? Well, well thank fun. you, Susan. G'day, everybody. It's, I'm delighted to be here. I've got to give you my official introduction. G'day, I'm Gary Ridge. I'm the consciously incompetent, probably wrong, and roughly right chairman emeritus of WD40 Company and the Culture Coach. Now, why I'm saying that, it's it, why I'm doing that intro, because it's really important, because a lot of the success that we had was based on the fact that it's about the people you have the privilege to lead, and how do you take them to a place where they are going to work every day doing something they love. Back in 1990. Seven, I was given the opportunity to lead WD40 Company. I was scared, but I wasn't afraid. And what I really, what I was scared about is how were we going to take a brand and take it to the world? So I looked around and I found a, a degree at the University of San Diego. It was a master's degree in executive leadership. And lo and behold, who led the first class? Susan and her husband, Drea. And what they talked about in that class was the, the power of having a compelling set of values and a purpose that actually enabled people. So I took that learning and other learning from that class. I, I developed a model and I executed it at WD-40 Company. And as Susan said, the rest is history in that we created this amazing culture of people. So Susan, you know, the work you did back then was pretty amazing. However, mm -hmm. your first book came out in, I think, 2014, right? It did, it did. And now you've gone to the length of, of, of the new edition. So tell me about why you have to republish a new edition. What's so special about what, you're <laughs> gonna learn, what we're going to learn by reading the new edition of this wonderful work? Well, Gary's actually pretty kind because when he first encountered these ideas, they were so at the beginning stages, there was just really nascent, nascent, whatever that word is. Anyway, very at the beginning stages. And so we've come a long way, baby. Um, we've taken really complex science. And I have to tell you, uh, the science of motivation is complex if, you, if you're looking at the good science. And it's literally taken uh, over a decade to get to the other side of complexity. So when the book came out in 2014, it was really the first book to really take a lot of that science and make it applicable. But we've learned so much since 2014. And we learned even more during COVID um, about what works and what doesn't work. And there's been some compelling research around that, some of which I want to share today. So we just felt that it was really important to, to take a look at things like, you know, what happened in the Great Resignation? Why are people quiet quitting? Um, why um, uh, is hybrid such a mystery? What, you know, how do we manage that whole hybrid? You know, what about all the controversy and all the stuff that's going on around DEI issues? And so we look at that through the lens of motivation science. And so it, the book is really uh, almost totally rewritten with the addition of two new chapters. It's really compelling, I think, um, ideas from people who put it into practice. So that was why we wanted to do it. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, let me just share with you, in fact, some of the way that we, um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, some of what we learned, Gary, is that we knew, we've always known, and can you all see my screen? Can you all nod your heads? I can't see anybody, there, but I'm assuming they can see it. We can. Um, okay, good. Um, that these three cycles, sorry, thought I under that, three psychological needs, um, are, are really um, groundbreaking breakthrough motivation science. So you're gonna hear a lot of people talking about people's psychological needs, but there's only three that have really been empirically validated that we can really hang our hat on and where it's, it's such good solid science. And so what we know is that if we can help people to fulfill these three psychological needs for choice, connection and competence, 
that there's going to be a shift in their energy. And when we talk about motivation, motivation is energy. So you have physical energy that enables you to you know, get through the day. But have you ever had one of those days where you're eating okay, you had a decent night's sleep, you've been exercising, but you can hardly drag yourself out of bed in the morning? No, you never have that kind of day, I know, <laughs> but, but some of us do. Um, and, and, and you go, what is that? And that's psychological energy. And so it's really important then to, to like ask yourself as you're getting out of bed in the morning, if, you, if you're like, oh gosh, you can say, what is it? Do I feel like I don't have choices that what's happening to me is imposed? Is that I don't have connection. I don't understand what's meaningful today. I don't have a sense of my purpose. I don't have a sense of how my values are going to actually come to fruition today. Um, or is it that maybe there's something that's an obstacle that I don't understand? I don't feel like I have the competence to meet the challenges that I'm going to face that day. And so what we know is that if you really want to move from low quality energy to vitality, it requires what's called these nutriments, which are like the physical nutrients that we eat. This is the psychological nutriments. And so what we've been able to do, and we're really excited about this, and this is one of the, the upgrades, if you will, in the book, is that we've um, really developed or, or we've extrapolated as well through the research, the leadership behaviors necessary to encourage choice, deepen connection, and to build competence in the workplace. So that's the message we want to get to leaders is how, how do you do this? How, you can't motivate anyone, but what you can do is you can create that environment where people's psychological needs are being fulfilled. And that's our mission. Um, you know what I think is also interesting, and Gary, I know that you talk a lot about servant leadership, and I mean, that's a, that's a big thing for you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you go back to, to uh, Greenleaf's definition of servant leadership, he says that the servant first leader is one who makes uh, um, people's highest priority needs their focus. Well, we now know what people's highest needs are. It's their psychological needs for choice, connection, and competence. So if you want to be a servant leader, it's really important that you um, develop these capacities. So what I'd like to do is, is tap Gary's um, experience and say, you know, when we talk about choice, what we're really talking about here, if you're looking at, at it as a psychological need, I want to describe that. And then I'd like Gary to explain how they did that at WD-40 as an example. So choice doesn't mean freedom. It doesn't mean you give free, people the freedom to do whatever they want. Choice means that people have a perception that they are in control of their actions, that they have alternatives, that they have options, and that they are um, the source of their own behavior. So even if people are doing something that you've told them to do, they could be choosing to do what you tell them to do. And that's, that's that perception of choice. So Gary, how at WD-40, how did you guys create that in your work? Well, thank you, Susan. And you know, one of the things we learned early is you cannot make anybody do anything. Right. They need to choose to do it. And choice is about taking away fear. One of the most disabling emotions we have is fear. Think about a deer in the middle of the road and there's a, a car coming with the lights. You would think the deer would get out of the way, but the deer is so scared that they stay on the road and get hit. So choice is about removing fear. I mean, I believe in organizations. Most people don't lie, they fake and hide. And the reason they fake and hide is because of the fear either of failure or the fear of feedback that they don't deserve around what they're doing. So the first thing about choice is, how do you make a, an environment safe? Mm. Now, you know, as leaders, we have to get that balance between being tough-minded and hearted. We have to get in that middle zone because a lot of people think servant leadership or leadership is about soft skills it's not soft at all and you know we have to be comfortable also that we're not protecting our own comfort zone at the expense of someone else's development but that's truly coming back to why are we there and as leaders we're there for one reason and you already touched on it we're there to help those we have the privilege they lead to lead step into the best version of their personal self mm -hmm. and we do that number one by reducing the negative impact of I'm afraid. Hmm. Uh, we introduced something that's really special. It's called the learning moment. I know I'm going to talk about that a little later on, but if you can think about it, from learning is the is the absolute catalyst for innovation. 
Oh, yeah. So we want to create that area of learning. So it's about reducing fear. It's just extraordinary to me how many people still feel that they can lead by creating fear, pressure, anger, resentment. You know, people often ask me, well, Susan, doesn't money motivate people? Doesn't power motivate people? Sure. Money, power, fear, anger, all of those things motivate people. What we're trying to say is there's an alternative. <laughs> you know, there are better ways to create a culture for people to be productive and to sustain that productivity. Because that's one of the things about the science of motivation. We're not interested in that momentary high where someone gets a burst of inspiration. We're talking about sustainable high performance where people also thrive so they can have a sense of well-being and have high performance simultaneously. I mean, we can do that. We know how to do that. It's about sustaining the environment so we can build an enduring company over time. Yes. That's what it's about. And it absolutely is. So you have to have a conviction of your values, right. which leads to deepen connection. Because connection means that you, um, you feel a genuine sense of belonging. Now, that's different. And you and I, are, we're going to talk about this in just a minute. Then we're going to talk about the concept of tribes, OK? Um, but a sense of belonging is really important, but it's got to be a sense of belonging based on values, mutual values, and a sense of purpose. And here's the kicker for the greater good, for the welfare of all. So if you have connection that is insular, that, oh, I belong to a tribe or I belong to a group, and um, that tribe or that group is um, uh, uh, in, in and an out group then that doesn't work. That does not meet the standard for connection. And so I love the way, and I don't even, I might have to feed you this. I don't even know if you know what I want you to talk about here, but could you talk about how you created that sense of belonging at WD-40, but it's not just an insular tribe. It's the way you define tribe. Yeah. So it's a group of people that come together to protect and feed each other and to act in a way of connectedness. But more importantly, if you think about tribes going back thousands of years and think about the attributes of tribes. Now, let me take you back to the middle of my homeland, Australia, thousands of years ago. And well, where you were there? No, oh, well, oh, oh, well, oh. I, I have pictures. <laughs> okay, okay. And we're observing a tribal gathering of Indigenous Australians. Here's, the, here's one of the key elements of tribalism. What is the tribal leader doing? The tribal leader is teaching the young tribe members to throw a boomerang. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the boomerang is the tool of survival. So in a tribe, what's the number one responsibility of a tribal leader? To be a learner and a teacher. Mm -hmm. So what does learning and teaching do? It, it connects you to the people because you are there helping them to step into their best version of their personal self. Everybody who's on this call today has left a party, a job, or even a relationship because they didn't feel like they belong. Right. Two things we want as human beings is, do I matter and do I belong? And if we create a tribal atmosphere where people matter and people belong, they will stay and they will then have that ultimate motivation over a long period of time that's sustainable because they belong. Maslow talked about it in his hierarchy mm -hmm. to self-actualization. Mm -hmm. Most organizations fill the two rungs at the bottom. You know, am I safe and am I going to have enough to survive? It's the loving and belonging one that they don't. Yeah, you know, um, Gary, one of the things that impressed me with the W40 um, values was the way when you talk about a tribe, it's not just the employees. And the way you define shareholders, it's, it's, it's so... It includes everybody. Well, our number two value at WD-40 is we exist to create positive, lasting memories in all of our relationships. And if you read the definition of that, it says positive, lasting memories with the people within the tribe, the community that we have the privilege to lead in, the, the shareholders that we serve, even our competitors. Yes. It's all encompassing in that this is not an exclusive group of people that's that's naive to the rest. Right. It's a group of people who come together to help those that they serve right. in total. And I just, I just wish more um, of us understood the power of creating that kind of connection. And, and here's one of my big bugaboos is that I can walk into most organizations and I can ask them, what are the organization's values? What's the organization's <laughs> look mission? Look on the wall. Exactly, look on the wall. 
Then if I ask, what are your personal values? What are the values that you bring to work every single day? Very few individuals have actually thought about that. They have, they're operating on programmed values, which by the way, is all the generational stuff, baby boomers and Gen X and Gen Y. Those are all programmed values. But what a really powerful, um, optimally motivating workforce does is it asks the individuals at the individual level to really consider and, and be thoughtful about their own values and how those values align with your organization's values. So one of the first things I ask leaders to do is to go back and have a values conversation, but not about the organization's values as much as about values of the, of the people that they're leading, to share those values, to develop those well, values. As you know, you know, one of the, the things in the class where I met you 20 some years ago, <laughs> when I had hair and you still looked as beautiful as you do today, but um, <laughs> is that, you know, you can adopt values, but unless they're embedded in the behavior of the organization, what I have is people visiting them instead of living them. <laughs> and in the book that I did with our friend Ken Blanchard, we talk about embedding the values in that conversa ongoing conversation you have with your people. So we had we asked people at least every 90 days, can you share how you live our values in the last 90 days? That is so, so important. In fact, when we get through with these three, I'm going to come back to that question because it's brilliant. And, and I, I would have recommend we could do it even more than every 90 days. So right on target. So um, building competence, and this is, you know, you've alluded to this a lot. When we talk about building competence, what we are talking about is the people's psychological need to feel like they're growing and learning, to feel that they can deal with everyday challenges, to feel that they are actually making progress. So if you think about Carol Dweck's mindset, the growth mindset, that's competence. If you think about Teresa Emma Beale's, um, progress principle. It's about uh, competence. If you think about resilience, it's about having the competence to deal with everyday challenges that we're all facing. And so when we think about the fact that every little kid, every toddler loves to learn, loves to grow. And then what happens is motivationally, we start rewarding them for learning with grades and trophies and stars and we externalize their love of learning to the, get to the point where they forget they love to learn. And so one of the things I always appreciated about um, the WD-40 company and your perspective was this focus on that learning moment. So, um, and I have a, a little uh, anecdote to share with you about um, one of your employees, but share with us, first of all, what you mean by the learning moment and how that operationalized, got operationalized at WD-40. Yeah, well, it's, well it, it was the, the catalyst for removing fear. You know, most people, um, don't run around corridors and scream out, hey, I failed today. But you know that uh, in most things they've done, 90% of, of learning comes from learning from experience. So we said, let's take the word failure out of our vocabulary and let's replace it with learning moments. And the definition of a learning moment is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that needs to be openly and freely shared to benefit all people. So there's the definition. And that gave people the freedom to be able to talk about, hey, I had a learning moment about this. I want to share it with you. I'm going to show you my scar tissue so you don't have to get scarred. Or I had a learning moment. This is how I want you to, I want to share it with you so you can amplify the positive outcome from it. And it's not unusual for you to be wandering around the corridors of the company in 17 offices around the world and to hear that and them often say, my learning moment was, my learning moment is. Can I, can I, that's the end. So um, our stepson, Ryan uh, Talbot, actually worked at WD-40 for a while um, and loved it. Uh, ended up going back to school to get his master's degree with the blessing of WD-40, but has such good things to say about working there. So I know from the inside out because he, he had the inside scoop, right? And he told me about a meeting he had, had been in that afternoon he said, uh, this guy, one of the execs walks in and he's just haggard, haggard and he's just like going, oh my God. And he goes, what's the matter? And he goes, you can't believe what just happened. And all of a sudden he caught himself and he said, we just had a really big learning moment. <laughs> <laughs> and it totally shifted the energy in that room. And that's the idea that when people are fulfilling their psychological needs, they have an energy shift. And that's what we talk about shifting from suboptimal motivation to optimal motivation through the fulfillment of these three psychological needs. 
So Gary, I just want to um, kind of put a, a cap on this by by saying that I think that you've done a brilliant job of of exemplifying how these get fulfilled in the organization. I'd also like to speak to every individual out there who's maybe not in a leadership role, but motivation is a skill. So the skill is to create choice, connection, and competence for yourself. Anytime you feel that your energy is being diminished or you feel depleted, you can ask yourself, why is that happening? And oftentimes it's because one or more of these psychological needs has gone missing or is being eroded. And I, I wanna just share um, some uh, real quick, just some research that I thought was fascinating. And this was a, glo a massive global study done by the McKinsey Company uh, post COVID. And they were curious what happened during the great resignation, why all these people left and why so many people were reporting this concept of quiet quitting. And they reported that the three primary reasons that people either left or would like to leave or have shut down is that they have a lack of autonomy and flexibility. They say anything for autonomy. The second was to escape a toxic culture and meaningless work. And what do you call that? I call it the great escape. <laughs> I wrote an article about it. They talked about, you know, people, the, the, this great resignation. That was the great escape. <laughs> and right. you know, why aren't people going back to offices now? You know why? Because they said, you want me to go back and get a fatal beating in that toxic culture I was in before? Exactly. I'm not going back. So. Leaders out there have to do this. They have to go, for people to come back again, we have to create, fill in the blank, whatever that blank is, what, in an environment that's not toxic. That's exactly right. And that means creating, helping people to, you know, have choice, connect, connection, and competence. Absolutely. The third thing they, they listed was desire for growth and learning opportunities. <laughs> so isn't this fascinating that the three things people cited in this big, massive research study was around choice, connection, and competence. I just think that's fascinating. Well, you know what I'm going to say? Hmm. Oh, duh. duh. <laughs> okay. Hey, Becky. Yes, ma'am. Here I am. Hi. So we, we wanted to, yes, I'm here. We want to take a moment and pause and talk a little bit about the important momentum that we always want to see for a book on launch day. And so I want to ask you if you are uh, gaining value from this conversation, and I know you are, to buy a copy of Why Motivating People Doesn't Work and What Does today, even if you have a copy of the old edition, because there's tons of brand new content here, even if you already have a copy of the new edition, because I want you to give it to someone else. And so Wendy is putting in the chat a link to buy the book on Amazon or your favorite retailer. If you are someone who leads a team, I want to ask you to consider buying this book book in bulk for conversation with your entire team. And then I want to ask you to take a few other actions because what we want is for this amazing content to make it a bigger difference in more people's lives and in more organizations. And the way that we can do that is by getting early momentum on Amazon through your reviews, uh, through social sharing, through uh, opportunities for you to share your book uh, with your network, this book with your network, Susan's new book with your network. So I want to ask you to do all of those things today. Um, and then later on, we have a few more ideas for you of ways you can get involved. But back to the conversation. Thanks, Becky, because um, I find it, you know, I, I find it awfully motivating for people to have the book and to, to learn from it. I still find it challenging to say, just go to Amazon right now and buy it. But um, I think it's really important for people to really understand the impact they have. If they were to like just multitask right now and go on Amazon and buy it, can you just speak real quickly to the power that rankings have? Sure. So, um... One of the things people don't know if you're not an author is that Amazon changes rankings every hour. And so one of the reasons we're asking all of you to multitask and buy the book right now is because all of those sales in one hour will help us bump in to hot new release categories, which will make it easier for the people who need Susan's book to find it. So that's why we want to have everyone take action all at once, which will help us get the bestseller banner, which will help more people find this book as they need it. And I just want to side note, Susan, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm in the chat about the audible and i think what's so remarkable about your audiobook is that you narrated the book this time that your guests like gary ridge has narrated his piece some of the stories feature the voices of the people whose stories you're telling like it's incredible so maybe Thank we'll you. get to see Thank that rank for the uh, audiobook today as well oh that's awesome yeah that was really fun and i and i do love the audible version for the different voices thank you so much for that um so 
you know, Gary, um, you are kind of in a different place now. Um, you're out there speaking and doing coaching. We'll talk a little bit more about coaching in, in a, a little bit, but there's, there's something that you share with your audiences that I've always thought was just so heartfelt. And you and I were having a conversation the other day about it. So I was wondering if you could share with people your thing about happiness. Well, that, you know, when we had that conversation, you made my head hurt as you've <laughs> often done. But what I say is imagine a place where you go to work every day, you make a contribution to something bigger than yourself. You learn something new, you feel safe, and are protected by a compelling set of values and you go home happy. Happy people create happy families. Happy families create happy communities. Happy communities create a happy world. And by God, we need a happy world. No one disagrees with that. And then we're having this conversation. You challenged me and you made my head hurt. But it was a wonderful conversation. So talk about it. Well, I just have this thing about the word happy. <laughs> and I, um, I know that it's just in our lingo. It just, it's, it's just part of who we are. But I would love for people to think about this concept of happiness in terms of motivation, because you can be happy for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. OK, so what happens is people say, oh, I'll be so happy if I win the lottery. But because they win the lottery and they may, maybe don't have a sense of purpose, they don't know, you know how to spend the money in a, in a way that's meaningful or they don't know how to manage money. So they don't have a sense of competence. So their psychological needs are thwarted and then all of a sudden they find themselves really unhappy, right? And so the idea is not about happiness. And I, you know, Gary and I also had a conversation about Schoenfreuder, that idea that if uh, something happens to somebody that you don't think highly of or that you don't agree with and, you know, maybe something bad happens to them, there's a little piece of it that goes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, it, and it's like, oh my gosh, I think what you did was you got in touch with if you're going to keep that kind of happiness that comes from somebody else's misery, it means they have to keep experiencing misery. And it's, and that's not a really great way for anybody to live. And that's the point that you made when we were having that conversation that kind of triggered my thought is that you're right. I mean, it's really bad to think you can be happy about something that hurts someone. But if you really uh, would be happy if that person got hurt, you would be happy, right? Yeah. And I thought, well, yeah, what is it? Is it fulfillment? And, and it's, I, I think I shared with you, I was talking to my amazing writing partner, uh, Martha Finney, mm -hmm. and we were then talking about, well, what is the word if it's not happy? What is it? And is it fulfilled? Is it, you know, we, we were thinking about what that is. My, my intent is that people are going home happy for the right reasons. Thank you. And that's the difference between suboptimal and optimal motivation. And so, that was really, thank you. That was a really nice um, <laughs> un, unintended segue. Yeah, thank you. Because, I rehearsed it. <laughs> you did? <laughs> um, so um, that's what the spectrum motivation model is all about. And, oh, I don't even have a copy. Do you have a copy of the book? Oh, absolutely. I did order, it's autographed. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, inside the inside cover of, of every book has this spectrum of motivation model in it. So I just want you to be aware that you'll have a copy of this. And what we're, we don't talk about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation because um, if it's, it's too, uh, it's, it's bipolar. <laughs> um, so if you're not intrinsically motivated to do something, that means you must have to be extrinsically motivated to do it. And that's not what the science says. The science says that we're either suboptimally or optimally motivated. And that suboptimal motivation is like the junk food of motivation. Uh, so if people are disinterested, like if there's a change initiative going on and they're so overwhelmed, they just stick their head in the sand and wait for it to be over. That's disinterested. External is when you're you're in it for the rewards, the money, the the power, the status, you know, and that's what makes you happy is all that external stuff. Or you're feeling imposed, meaning that you um, feel pressured or fear that you were if talking you don't, about. This will exactly, or I have to do something or else. Right. And so those three types of motivation are called suboptimal motivation. And so you could be happy because you have external rewards coming your way, but it will. What the science says is that you will not have a sense of well-being. You're you will have maybe a, a spurt in energy just like you do when you eat sugar or carbs or gotcha. caffeine. Yeah, yeah. But it's going to fall. It's not going to be sustainable over time. And that's that's what you and I are talking about. That happiness is fleeting. Happiness is based on what's happening in the moment. So we can control our psychological well-being if we then have the skill of motivation to be able to shift from suboptimal to optimal motivation. 
And that's what we teach at Mojo Moments. We teach individuals how to shift their motivational outlook, how to identify, first of all, what motivational outlook they have, and then how to shift. And then we teach leaders how to create an environment where people can more greatly self or, or more um, have a higher quality of self-regulation. And so that they're aligned to values, that they're integrated with a deep sense of purpose or fulfillment, yes. and that they're having fun. And so these are the optimal motivational outlooks. These are six motivational outlooks. And so happiness tends for most people to hinge down here. What we're asking, and you said it perfectly, we want to be happy for the right reasons. We want to win for the right reasons. Competition is not bad. No. But winning for the sake of winning or winning for power and status or glory or money, that's why there's been research, by the way, I'm really into the NBA playoffs right now. Um, called the um, contract year, that players who are up for contract renewal have extraordinary numbers and are totally successful. And then the year they after they sign their contract, they demonstrably, all their numbers go down and they suck for that next year. And it's because they were externally motivated and then they have a letdown in their energy because they haven't got the vitality of optimal got motivation. It. So that's the spectrum of motivation. And, and Susan, yeah, one ahead. of the things that I learned from our friend Marshall Goldsmith, yeah. who's the number one executive coach in the world, he talks about one of the behaviors of, if you will, toxic leaders is wanting to win too much. Yes. Wanting to win too much. Yeah. So for what purpose? For like what, what purpose? Is, what, where does it go? And so that that really is um, the, the, the whole idea of the spectrum of motivation. Um, and so... Uh, we would like to encourage people to figure out what their motivational outlook is. And so um, I think somebody, um, Wendy or, or Becky or Nikita, um, are going to put into the chat right now the URL. And what this will do is take you to our, what's your MO? What's your motivational outlook survey? And it just takes you less than 10 minutes. This I would prefer you don't do and multitask right now, but uh, capture the link or go to the link. And then when we're done, I would love for you to take this survey. And here's the thing, you know, you've, your whole life has kind of gone into um, a, a new direction with coaching. Um, we think that coaches could really benefit by understanding the role motivation plays. So, and I don't know if you've, if you've had this experience, but a lot of coaches that we um, have worked with tend to, um, they don't like the business part of coaching. They love to coach, but they don't want to have to build the business. You built a business, so that part of it's okay for you. But if we would like to have coaches take this survey and say, what's my motivational outlook to actually build my business? What's my motivational outlook to actually increase my fees? So what other challenges have yeah. you seen? So I'll go back to my motivational or my purpose as a coach. Yeah. Okay. So I, if I can accomplish one thing, it would be to help companies create a workplace culture where people go to work. They feel like they belong, they know their matter, and that, that it's not command and control or micromanagement. Mm. So when I get up every day, my purpose is to help organizations create that, because I know if they create that, the people who go to work every day yeah. are going to go home fulfilled yeah. Yeah. and happy for the right reason. <laughs> and if they go home happy for the right reason, right. they're going to have happy families and Business today has a huge responsibility to make a change in the world because we touch so many people every day. You know what, Gary? I saw um, a statistic that said that over 75% of the time we spend awake as adults is connected to work. Absolutely. And, and, and so why in the world wouldn't we try to create optimally motivating environments for people to work in? It's only going gonna, it's, it's to just serve everybody and everything. And Susan, one of the things that we're facing right now, which is going against the, one of the key optimizing parts of the work you do is connection. Yes. And if we are, you know, I was on a webinar this morning, I was talking about why do people get put in solitary confinement <laughs> in a jail, right? Yeah, it's only going to make it worse. It's, they're going to they commit suicide. Yeah. What we're doing today by not creating an atmosphere where people want to go to work and connect, we're putting them into mental co mm -hmm. solitary confinement, sure. which is going to shrink them completely. So we've yeah. got to find a way of fixing that. Well, I think we have it. You got it. Well, I think, I don't mean the whole thing, but I mean, I do believe a start is for leaders to understand the nature of human motivation. Yes. And, and, and when, when we talk about optimal motivation, what we're talking about is a person's ability then to both 
perform and sustain high performance and thrive so that people are flourishing. They can flourish and be productive. They don't have to be, those two ideas don't have to be. Um, and that's why my challenge to leaders out there is to be brave enough now to create the atmosphere where people are connecting back in the offices. Yes. You have to be brave enough. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't mean we have to be back at the office five days a week. We've learned we can do some things at home, but we have to be brave enough to say, we are going to come together in number of days a week for one true purpose, to ensure that we don't lose our personal connection. Because if we lose that personal connection, we're dead. You know, and there was some research just lastly yeah. that came out in Australia just this week where they're actually pointing to an increase in mental illness oh. because people aren't going to offices and connecting with people because you they're know, in solitary the, the, the UK um, actually appointed a minister of loneliness. Oh. And the Surgeon General two weeks ago just said that, that loneliness is now um, considered a major kind of affliction and that they're going to start to attempt. So come on, businesses, so, get connected. It, exactly. And so, so that's what this whole idea of psychological needs is, is that if, if people's psychological needs are being fulfilled, then when you look at hybrid, you go, how do we create a hybrid program that gives people choice, that creates connection or deepens connection and builds competence? I'm going to the office today because fill in the blank. What's the blank? Exactly. And in the book, I actually give like three or four different examples of approaches to hybrid. And most of them don't work, but I give one that does. And it's um, actually uh, somebody that we know, Chris Wallerman um, and Lynn Hutton of um, Innova, and the way that they have implemented um, hybrid learning based on the spectrum of motivation Absolutely. model. So, hey, Becky, I think, um, do we have questions that we could? We have so many questions. Okay. So I want to start with this one from Olivier. I Hopefully I'm saying your name correctly. Very curious for... Uh, hearing an explanation about the difference between the three optimal motivation, um, aligned, integrated, and inherent. Could you explain the difference between those three? Yeah, sure can. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to share the, the screen. I'll just. I'll just do that. So aligned is a more conscious um, uh, motivational outlook. It's when you're consciously aware that you have a value that could be aligned to whatever it is you're asking somebody to do or asking yourself to do. Um, when I became a vegetarian overnight uh, as a person who absolutely loved eating meat and had a pot of pork grease on her stove because everything tasted better with bacon grease. Um, but overnight, I became a vegetarian because I watched a documentary about the way we treated the animals we eat. And I realized that it, it was an affront to my values. And was, I was very conscious of it. And so for years, when I stopped eating meat, um, I would get in touch with my values that were enabling me to do that. And people would say, oh, you've got so much willpower. Wow, you're so disciplined. And I would say, I have no willpower, no discipline. That's not even a factor. I am values-based. Well, that was 40 years ago. Today, I don't have an aligned motivational outlook. It's integrated. It's just something that is within me. It is who I am. It's the way I, if you said, Susan, describe yourself. One of the first ways I would describe myself is I'm a vegetarian. And so it's, it's become just a part of who I am. And so if we can help uh, people or ourselves connect whatever we're doing with developed values that we're consciously choosing and aware of, or if we really can have a deep sense of purpose, I know people who overnight change their entire way of, of looking at the world because of a death in the family or um, a crisis event. And suddenly they saw a, a whole new purpose in their lives and they became integrated to do the kind of work they were doing based on an overnight. So this is not something that has to take a long time. It's like we can literally shift in the moment. Um, and then inherent is when we do something just for the fun of it. Uh, we don't even know why we're doing it. So if you think about what you gravitate towards when um, you have discretionary time, if you ever have this. Or if you don't have discretionary time and you yearn to be doing something, you long to be doing something, then that's probably what you're inherently motivated to do. So what we describe in the book are the differences between the six motivational outlooks. How to identify when you or someone else is in one of those outlooks? And then how do you either maintain your optimal motivation or how do you shift your suboptimal motivation? So when you take that, um, what's your MO survey? You're going to get immediate results that will explain whether you're optimally or suboptimally motivated. But if you want to opt in later to um, a free webinar to just learn a little bit more about that, then you'll have a chance to do that as well. 
So let me give a simple example. I have a blue shirt on today. So why do I have a blue shirt on today? Because Susan said to me, um, can you wear a blue shirt because it, it fits in with my model? So one of my values is positive lasting memories. So I wanted to create a positive lasting memory for Susan today. So I went to my cupboard and wore a blue shirt and it happened to be the blue of a line. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. That's a great story. <laughs> hey, Gary, I before, love hey, that oh, too. Uh, Becky, just before you do that, I just happened to see in the chat, could you ask Gary to repeat the statement about the learning moments? So oh, yes. Just do it real quick? Sure. So the definition of a learning moment, it's a positive or negative outcome of any situation that has to be openly and freely shared to benefit all people. You Thank go. you for that. And you'll have the recording of this so you can hear it again. So I saw a question earlier from Benta um, who was asking, is a genuine sense of belonging, is that possible for everyone or for all in an organization? I would say it depends on the culture of the organization. You know, is the, is the culture one where people are authentic about caring about the people that they have the privilege to lead? You know, it's about how many times have we asked people, how are you? What's on your mind? Is anything getting in your way? It's how, how dedicated is your coach to helping you play your best game? So, you know, thinking about why I belong. You know, Gary, I remember a conversation we had back in 2013. <laughs> and the reason I remember this is because I ended up writing about it in the book in 2013. And it was about when you have an organization with set your values, and those values are, val are, are, are really thoughtful and you're actually operationalizing those values, then people, if they start thinking about their own values and you start having those values conversations, guess what they do? They either stay because there's a values alignment or they leave. And so I would say that it's up to the individual as well to really understand their own values and then to look at the values of the organization they're working in and make a choice. So I think that that is, and, and, if, and if they're saying, wow, I, I, don't have, I can't afford to leave. I work in a toxic culture and I can't afford to leave. Then here's what we teach people. We say, okay, you, still, you may not have a choice to leave in your mind, but you have choices. What choices do you have? What could you learn by living in this toxic culture about resilience? What, how could you actually affect the people around you by living your values so thoroughly that you become a light in the darkness? So what we teach people is that if you're saying you're making the choice to stay, then you have other choices you could make to make the most of that as one of Gary's learning moments. In our piece of research, you know, we've been testing employee engagement for 20 years. 98% of the people, they love to tell people they worked at the company. 97% said they respected their coach, respected. 97% said they believed their values were aligned with the company's values. That's extraordinary. Yeah. So that's just a strong cultural alignment. Yeah. Alignment. And, you know, you're speaking about engagement. I'm just going to do a, I don't know, what would you call it? It's not a plug. I'm not plugging anything, but I would like to just acknowledge that my husband, Dr. Drea Zagarmi, is one of the foremost researchers on employee work passion. And work passion is the upper end of engagement. And what we know about that is that when people have employee work passion, they have five intentions. They have the intention to stay in the organization, to endorse the organization to others, like, hey, come work for it, this is a really cool place, to use discretionary effort on behalf of the organization, to um, uh, exceed or uh, perform at above expected standards, and to demonstrate um, uh, what's called citizenship behavior, organizational citizenship behaviors. So would you want everyone in your organization, wouldn't you want to be a person who has employee work passion? Well, what we did was a study that showed that there was a direct correlation between people who are optimally motivated and their five intentions, those five intentions. So there was, so motivation, optimal motivation is what fuels the upper end of employee engagement. We found that there was really no correlation between suboptimal motivation and those mm -hmm. five intentions. But if someone was disinterested, if they had that disinterested motivational outlook, then they, there was a significant negative correlation. In other words, they're actually going to sabotage yeah. those intentions. So there is absolutely this integration between what we know about motivation and the resulting engagement or employee work passion. Absolutely. 
Thank you for that. So I have a question from Roxanne and she's wondering if you have any recommendations for creating connection in a fully remote team when the team members are scattered across the country. Well, I think you and I can both speak to this because our new company, Mojo Moments, um, our team is across six time zones um, and it's a small team. <laughs> and so we're literally working 24 seven. Um, and Gary, I, you know, WD-40 obviously is global brand. No matter where I was in the world, I would say, do you know the company WD-40? And every time, I didn't care where I was, somebody knew it. And so um, the thing that we believe, and I'll, then I'll let Gary speak to this, we believe that values are the glue. And what we try to do is to live those values. So we're constantly asking ourselves, okay, on this goal, what is your motivation? Are you optimally or suboptimally motivated? Uh, we also practice uh, SL2, the, the language of situational leadership, where we uh, are looking at people's development level and making sure we're giving the appropriate leadership style. So what we've found is that um, certain models, like we use the DISC personality model, that a lot of people might eschew these kinds of models, but we've found is that it actually creates a common language. And so when you've got people from various cultures, different cultures, they're speaking different languages, it's really helpful to have models where they can share the language. And then one final thing, because I know you will agree with that because you sent every executive at WD-40 through the program uh, the, at USD to learn the common language. But the reason that I am so excited about the spectrum of motivation, about the three psychological needs is that these are human needs. They transcend culture, gender, generation, race, uh, country. So these are human needs for choice, connection, and competence. And that's why my original book was, was translated into 14 different languages. Because when you speak the language of optimal motivation and the spectrum, it is um, global. It's a foundational um, yeah, it's, language. You know, it's simple parts of life. Um, you know, do you have the freedom to make a choice? Um, can you be connected to people? And how do you develop? And that's the learning side. And you're right about values. You know, we values are the glue that holds our, our, our culture together. And each one of our values uh, has a written description yes. of what living that value uh, looks like. So our first value is we value doing the right thing. Because we write the description, our co we're common doing the right thing around the world. Because if we didn't do that, doing the right thing in China might look a little tiny bit different <laughs> to doing the right thing in the United States or doing the right thing in Australia or the UK. Our second value is we value creating positive, lasting memories in all of our relationships. What does that look like? There's a paragraph that says, this is what it looks like. The great thing about that is it allows you to have the conversation based on the values. And we've already agreed that this is the platform. And the other thing, and I learned this from Ken Blanchard, and it's so, so strong you need to have hierarchical values. Our number one value holds more weight than our number six value. Right. Um, and at least the first three are more important than the last three. Yeah. And that stops people from cherry picking the value against the current situation because yeah. that can happen. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, I would like to um, just say that just to, to build, build on what Gary just said, that if you were to just take away one thing from what we've said today. And, and it has to do with asking people, you know, having a, a good conversation with people. What if at the end of every day, you simply ask people, tell me about the choices you made today. That reminds people that they had choices and they actually made choices. And which of those choices did you make that were aligned to your values, to the values of the organization? What, what choices did you make that were meaningful? Or what, did you, what happened today that you found meaning in? So, you know, that whole idea of connection, you know, what did you do today that you felt was um, uh, contributed to the greater good, that that contributed to the welfare yeah, of others? It's about, you're talking about gratitude. Well, it is, isn't it? Yes. And then the third question, what did you learn today? What what choices did you make that helped you to learn? Um, I have a, a, a young coach that I've helped coach who was the, um, he ended up, uh, anyway, I, I won't go into the whole story, but he's a baseball coach in a, at a college. And he started having those conversations with his team after every game. And for the first time in 35 years, they went to the, the finals. And so 
he's, he swears by just asking these three questions at the end of every practice. Well, that's one of the, the attributes of a great coach is spending time in the locker room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you know, that. that's, that's, you know, if you're a great coach, what are the attributes of a great coach? Well, number one is you have to understand what it takes to win. Number two is you have to be clear about accountability. What do I expect from you and what do you expect from me? And then what do you do? You spend a lot of time on the sideline observing the play. You never, ever, ever run onto the, onto the field and try and kick the ball. You <laughs> never, ever, ever go to the podium to pick up the prize. And you spend a lot of time in the locker room. And if you didn't have that framework, if you could think about coaching a football team and there are no goalposts and no time, right. what would you have at the end of that? A whole lot of tired people running around a field, not right. achieving anything and getting frustrated. Right. So our right. job as a coach is to create that environment, which is connected to exactly what you talk about. Well, you know what, Gary, here's the whole thing too. That, And this is why I'm encouraging any coaches out there to take the what's your MO survey and really think about how this works in your coaching practice. Because let's say that you set the goals, you have the goalpost set, you've given people all the resources they need, um, you've agreed on the values that are, are, you know, maybe are going to underlie the, those. But if you really have someone who is suboptimally motivated, they feel that the goal that, the, that you've set or with them is imposed. Mm -hmm. um, if they don't see the meaning in it, if they can't find the val their value in it, if they don't think it's meaningful, and they're overwhelmed. There's not a development process. There's not a way to teach them how to do what they need to do effectively. And they don't have the resources that they need. If they don't have a sense of choice, connection, and competence, and you're trying to coach them, it's, it's like building a castle on sand. Mm -hmm. That All of your planning, all of your forward movement action plan is simply going to collapse. They're just going to get exhausted. Yeah, exhausted. So, Becky, I'm sorry. Gary and I just sit here and talk to each other. Hey, this is amazing, but I do want to, a few people have asked, could Susan, could you repeat the three questions that you could ask at the end of the day? Yes. And by the way, they're definitely in the book because it's a really, it's what we call facilitating a mojo moment. And that is what choices did you make today? And what choices, I'm going to do it really simple, but real simple three. What choices did you make today? Which choices gave you a sense of meaning, value, purpose contributed to something greater than yourself? And what choices did you make that you learned from and what did you learn? Um, so it's really about just asking people about the choices, the connection and the competence of that. Imagine if the end of the week we ask people, what did you learn this week that is going to help you to help others or to help you to be better next week instead of what did you do? You know, what did you accomplish this week? What, where are you on your goals? Um, I would just encourage people to ask those questions about choice. And here's a question that I asked when I think yeah. I shared it with you is, Am I being the person I want to be right now? Mm, I love that. Yeah. And who is that person? And make yourself a list of who you want to be. Because what happens is life will pull you off that path of who you want to be. And for 25 years, I've had, and if I had my notebook here, I'd hold it up and show you. I have it written on the front of my notebook. I still ask myself, am I being the person I want to be right now? And, and I know we need to, to move yeah, on. Yeah, you have a slide to show for me, right, Susan? Oh, I do. So um, we want to make sure that uh, when you uh, think about why motivating people doesn't work and what does, this book is geared for leaders and coaches. So Susan has been directing some comments and Gary to people who are coaching others. But Susan has another amazing book called Master Your Motivation that is primarily written to individuals who want to understand motivation science. So we would encourage you to buy these books in combo and learn in your team from both of them at the same time. Again, why motivating people doesn't work and what does, geared toward leaders, geared toward coaches, and master your motivation, geared toward individuals. And Susan, I think that we're going to have you and Gary share some parting thoughts, uh, but we do want to make sure that people take important actions, buy the book today, review the book on Amazon if you've already read the new edition, and make sure you take that motivational outlook survey. And if you're one of the first 50 people to do so, you'll receive a free audiobook or ebook and you can choose. You know what? I didn't even mention that earlier, Becky, because I didn't want people to think that we wanted them to take the survey so they could win a book. Um, I do want to say, though, that there's a difference between trying to incentivize people to do something and, as Gary was talking, expressing gratitude. So we just are so grateful for the first 50 people that um, go in, on and take that survey. And you'll have a choice of either the ebook or the or a, um, an audio book. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that, Becky. So Gary, just you know, we've got one minute left. Um, just a, a parting shot. 
you know, I think that if we realize that it's not about us, if we realize that our job as leaders is to create an environment where people thrive, I think the three things that Susan talks about are the key elements to creating that because our job as leaders is to help people step into the best version of their personal self because life's a gift and you don't want to send it back unwrapped. <laughs> I love it. And I would just like to say that motivation is at the heart of everything people do and everything they don't do, but which they did. And so as leaders, you need to understand the nature of human motivation. And as individuals, the more you understand, the more you can actually shape a world around you um, that shares that positive vitality. And as Gary has said, boy, does the world need that right now. So thank you all. Wow, that was fun. I, I mean, we had fun. We hope you yeah. did. <laughs> we had a lot of fun here. Yeah.